Я хочу звернутися до нашої української аудиторії, привітати всіх учасників з нашим лончем «Айсап Україна» і звернути вашу увагу, що наш лонч буде відбуватися англійською мовою, тому всіх, хто буде бажати перекладу на українську, звернути увагу в чат, де знаходиться інструкція по включенню синхронного перекладу. Вітаю ще раз всіх і перехожу на англійську мову. Good morning, dear colleagues, dear friends. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all today. My name is Irina Pinchuk. I am a director of Institute of Psychiatry of Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv, vice president of Ukrainian Psychiatry Association, Country Director, International Technology Transfer Center Ukraine, uh, Head of ISAP Ukraine National Chapter. Our event takes place within uh, the uh, eighth annual Psychiatric International Conference, uh, 21st Century Psychiatry, a global impact on modern society and new practice in the field that is conducted on behalf of Ukrainian Psychiatric Association. First and foremost, I would like to announce uh, the official opening of ISAP Ukraine National Chapter. We invite to join everyone who involved in field of the drug demand reduction in Ukraine to join our team and to become a member of the ISAP Ukraine National Chapter. In Ukrainian embroidery, uh, every color has its own meanings. Red symbolizes love, joy, continuity of kind, yellow sun, health and wealth, blue water. ISAP's optimistic colors in the logo and its opening in our country symbolize for us the new eras for Ukrainian drug demand reduction, for health and education, for new training and job potential, and for our members with a new beginning of global cooperation. Thank you for your being part of the fresh and colorful beginning. I would like to introduce uh, my colleague and other moderator of today's events, Olga Myshakivska. Olga is uh, Ukrainian currently uh, holding the position of ISAP National Chapters Regional Coordinator in Asia and uh, with the overview of ISAP Ukraine's role with the Europe and uh, Middle East ISAP region. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, Irene. Uh, Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, before... Um, we move uh, to our presentation. Uh, we have welcome message uh, from uh, two of ISAF's partner organization, uh, United Na Nation Office on, on Drug and Crime, and uh, ICUDDR, the International Consortium of University for Drug Demand Reduction. First of all, I would like have in introduced Michael Miowski from ICU DDR, but unfortunately uh, he is unable to join our session today and so sent us a welcome video record. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, that's a great honor to me to say hello from my office in Prague. I'm Michael Miowski and I'm leader of Czech national chapters. And at the same time, I'm sitting on two chairs because I'm also representing International Consortium of Universities on Drug Demand Reduction. 
And from both perspectives, I'm so glad you achieve this level and you can open your national chapters. We did it just two weeks ago in Czech Republic in Prague, and I'm so glad that our family is constantly growing and we can develop this international partnership. I would like to emphasize also another aspect because uh, national chapters is about linking international context and national about supporting development of our institutional infrastructure in our countries in terms of uh, addiction specific institutions. This is big improvement and big uh, shift in our field. And I would like to say thank you to Professor Irina Pinchuk for her work, great work, because uh, it's not so long time when you have opened your uh, ATTC center uh, when you finished your job in terms of uh, national uh, needs assessment. And that's wonderful to see how effective and how fast is your work, Irina. And I would like to say not only thank you, but also cross fingers for upcoming years. And hopefully uh, we will see each other personally really soon in better times after COVID infection. And I will be really glad uh, for developing more intensive collaboration between our countries. Uh, because as I remember, it's just a couple of months ago when we applied for the first money uh, in, in the context of joint project between Ukraine and Czech Republic. And I think that it can be only beginning of more intensive and more extensive international collaboration inside of Europe and of course with other regions, with other continents and colleagues from other universities and institutions. Stay care, take care and, and stay safe and enjoy today lunch. And again, and again please, please have a good have time, a good time and, and, and cross fingers and cross again fingers with, again, uh, with national, chapters national chapters of Ukraine, of Ukraine and, 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 and congratulations again, again to all of you. All Thank, of you. you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me and for inviting you in ODC to the launch of the national ISAP chapter in Ukraine. My name is Anja Busse and I work for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation section. It's a huge pleasure for us to be here with you today and I also extend the greetings of my colleagues at the UNODC Ukraine office. Networks of professionals such as ISAP all committed to advance the field of substance prevention and substance use disorder treatment have an amazing strength and need to play an important role in promoting a constant change to evidence-based practices in our field. One person alone, as we know, does only go so far, but if people join in that are all committed to the goal of offering better services for men, women, children at risk of substance use or living with substance use disorders, this can have a wider reach and bring about substantive and measurable improvements. An inclusive national ISAP chapter in Ukraine will be an important platform for exchange and sharing at country level among the various disciplines that contribute to quality prevention and quality treatment and can also make the voice of people living with substance use disorders and their families and communities heard. A national chapter of ISAP in Ukraine, furthermore, will be part of the global ISAP family and provide ample opportunities for mutual support and exchange with other ISAP chapters, as well as the ISAP partners around the world. UNODC is very happy to count itself to the group of friends and partners of ISAP since the very early days. Many good ideas and inspiration for the development of tools, strategies and policies can come from open dialogues, at least in our experience at UNODC with networks of professionals. National level decision makers, as you all know, have taken a number of important commitments at the level of the General Assembly um, of the United Nations, especially in the year 2016, when there was a special session on drugs, um, and also in deciding the priorities for the Sustainable Development Goals. Prevention and treatment have a core place, not only in international drug policy agreements that put health in the center, but also in the Sustainable Development Goal, for example, three on health 
and therefore a core part of international development agenda. As dedicated professionals in your country, you can remind policymakers of the decisions they have taken and help them with the expertise and experience um, to put the commitments taken internationally in practice at national level. In, this re um, in the end, this needs to be a collective effort, not guided by ideology, but by what works in practice, protecting health and promoting the well-being and recovery of children, youth, families, as well as people who use drugs, people with drug use disorders, whether in community settings or in prison settings, groups that are therefore at some of the most stigmatized and vulnerable people globally, and that can need all of the support and empowerment we can collectively offer. Let me close in wishing you a successful start and that ISAP Ukraine will become a much appreciated platform for all people committed to improve the prevention of drug use and the treatment and care of drug use disorders in your country and as part of your international networks. Thank you so much again for having us. Uh, we now have a very important presentation from uh, the USA and the man who had the vision to help ISAP happen. It is my honor to introduce you our first panelist, Brian Morales from USA, uh, branch chief, Country Narcotics, Office of Global Programs and Policy, INL Bureau at uh, USA Department of State. Brian, we appreciate my, much for you begin with us today, and uh, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. If uh, just give me one moment here to um, start my presentation. Okay, so you should see my presentation now on the screen. Thank you all so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Congratulations on the launch of ISAP Ukraine. Uh, oops, I think I just lost. Can you all see my screen? Um, Ukraine is a very important um, country and partner of the United States. and I work at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, as Irina mentioned, I'm the chief of the counter-narcotics uh, branch, and we work in over 110 countries around the world to address the issue of substance use. Uh, this year, we've identified key partners, and there are five countries of priority for developing partnerships in this area. And I'm uh, very pleased to announce that Ukraine is one of those top five countries of, of priority and partnership. So we look forward to, um, to continuing the work that we've uh, started and to deepen cooperation uh, over the coming year. The presentation that I'm delivering today uh, is focused on um, basically addressing one question uh, or three questions here. It's why and how and do we bother um, um, addressing this issue of substance use? And I'm going to take a global perspective, but I'm sure that um, you'll find the um, the parallels to um, to uh, domestic uh, situation as well. Uh, so three questions for today's presentation. What is the challenge that we face? Why should we address it? And how do we address the challenge? And I want to start off by um, going to the UNODC World Drug Report. Uh, UNODC in um, 2020, around, I think it was around June, uh, issued its latest World Drug Report, and it shows some trends that um, beyond the COVID pandemic, which we know has uh, increased substance use rates, increased isolation, and caused um, um, all sorts of dynamics to uh, substance use, which has aggravated it. Um, we had some trends over the past years which are highlighted uh, in this report. We've seen that the drug use market is becoming uh, in increasingly uh, expanded and complex. And uh, we have to look a little bit more at, at the numbers. Um, one of the reasons is population growth and market expansion. Now, between 2009 to 2018, the number of drug users in the world has increased from 210 million to 269 million. It seems like an increase uh, of 
of uh, 60 million. Uh, however, if you look at the percentage um, of the world's population that's consuming, it's only increased from 4.8 to 5.3. So there has been an increase, but it's been a relatively modest uh, increase. And part of that can be explained by urbanization, which is a driving factor. Um, and uh, that is also a factor, we think, in future drug markets. Since 1960, well, in 1960, there were 34% of the world's population that lived in urban areas. And since then, there's been a uh, mass migration to cities. Today, over 50% uh, of people live uh, around the world live in urban areas. And so uh, we know that urban people consume more than people in rural areas. There's also increasing wealth that's linked to higher uh, drug use, but we also have to remember that the poorest suffer the largest burden of disorders. Uh, one example for, uh, is, is cocaine. Uh, we uh, associate oftentimes cocaine with high income countries or people with, um, with more uh, wealth, but the price is dropping. And we've seen that uh, traffickers are adding toxic adulterants uh, which dilute the product, but also cause all kinds of harmful situations. They leave in the impurities during the manufacturing process and create all kinds of variations of these drugs. So the price points drop and they become accessible to street children throughout Latin America. We've seen in South Asia, um, opium also becoming accessible to younger and younger populations. Uh, so it's quite concerning uh, to see that the poorest and most vulnerable continue to suffer the, the brunt of, of this disease. And we also have seen another trend, the emergence of substances not under international control stabilize. Uh, however, the, the new uh, potentially harmful opioids are increasing. Uh, drug markets are becoming increasingly complex. We see now beyond the plant or uh, market, the, the organic market of, of drugs that are cultivated like opium and coca, we see now um, hundreds and hundreds of synthetic drugs, many that are not under international control. This is a little bit of the UNODC World Drug Report, which many of you are familiar with. Let me further um, explain that the challenge that we face is also one of resources. Um, unfortunately, around the world, many governments continue, most governments continue supporting counter-narcotic strategies that are resourced more towards supply reduction measures than demand reduction measures. Uh, we also see from a public health strategy that many public health systems around the world provide um, resources to very critical um, public health issues like HIV, TB, malaria, and there's global funds for these, but we don't see something comparable for the issue of addressing substance use. And so the investments, both from a public health and from a counter-narcotics perspective, uh, are insufficient to meet the uh, global challenge. Another challenge that we see is the slow adoption of evidence-based practices. The vast scientific research in the field is not being disseminated to the global workforce. Uh, this is a, a, a significant challenge that we face. Addiction remains misunderstood by many, uh, and many evidence-based programs, um, um, and many programs do not sort of incorporate uh, evidence-based practices, and this is a, a challenge. And as a result, when we don't incorporate evidence-based practices uh, in, in the programs, treatment fails, um, clients, families, communities lose hope, and they lose confidence in treatment, and they start um, grasping and promoting um, um, policies and experiments that are in the extreme, either very draconian in, it, in their practices or very defeatist. Um, you know, there is no hope. We might as well make drugs accessible, legalize, focus on only minimizing the harms um, instead of actually um, sort of investing in drug prevention and treatment and, and having hope and optimism for recovery, which is absolutely possible and validated um, through the research. So why do we bother? Why do we um, focus and address um, this issue of, of substance use? Two reasons I propose. One, because it impacts eight different aspects of our society, which I'm going to describe in, in some detail. And second, because the interventions have been validated by science to work. So um, uh, we have a lot to be optimistic and positive uh, about. The impact of substance use is, um, very comprehensive. Uh, it's very cross-cutting. 
we of course know that drug use impacts drug cultivation, production, and trafficking. Uh, um, consumers will incentivize drug producers to, to grow and produce and traffic, and this is a uh, symbiotic relationship. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's both, it works both ways. We also know that uh, drug use uh, impacts communicable diseases and mental health. It can initiate or exacerbate mental health um, disorders. It can uh, expand and spread communicable diseases like the ones that I uh, previously mentioned. We also know that drug use can have an impact on public security, the violence and crime in our streets and in our communities. It can also fuel organized crime, corruption, money laundering, and a lot of these other um, transnational uh, threats that, that our societies face. Drug use can also impact terrorism and insurgency. Many anti-government elements um, use drugs in ways to um, to either fuel profits uh, for their activities or to provide it to their, um, their, their agents, um, their fighters, to conduct um, um, terrorist or insurgent activities. We also know that uh, drug use has an impact on economic development and productivity, and we have ways of calculating the amount of, um, of resources that are lost as a result of, of drug use. And we know that uh, drug use has an impact on the social development of children. Uh, children who have parents that use drugs uh, are more likely to use drugs themselves. And uh, it becomes a vicious cycle of drug use and poverty and crime and violence and neglect. Uh, and finally, governance. Drug use impacts governance because one can think of leaders having to contend with all of the issues that I just discussed. Uh, and it's it's very concerning um, uh, to have one of these uh, sort of uh, challenges, but to see all of these come together makes governance all the more challenging. So I also want to now discuss that the reason we should address this is because there's a tremendous amount of good news. There's more than 70 years now of scientific research that validate the field of substance use, uh, prevention and treatment. Not everyone who uses drugs develops a substance use disorder. And prevention of substance use and treatment of substance use disorders is possible. We know that the programs and that the services work. And we know that substance use treatment is as effective as any other chronic relapsing diseases, as many of the chronic relapsing diseases that we track and measure, and that recovery is possible. And here's just one uh, chart to illustrate that. Um, percentage of patients who relapse with uh, um, substance use disorders being between 40 to 60 percent in terms of, of their success rate. We have diabetes at 30 to 50 percent, hypertension 50 to 70 percent, and asthma 50 to 70 percent. So it's on par with other chronic relapsing diseases. Here's another look at the effectiveness of treatment, and this is something I hear a lot um, you know, you go into treatment, so your consumption is high before treatment in the, in the first column, and then you go through treatment, your consumption is low, and after you leave treatment, uh, consumption may resume at, uh, at, at perhaps a decreased level, and this, is, um, this happens many times. Many times there's relapse. It's part of the natural cycle of, of the disease. Many people would say, ah, but that's ineffective because um, you only stop using during treatment and then you're using after. Um, but we have to look at this as part of a continuum of care. And we have to also consider that this is actually not the chart for substance use, it's a chart for hypertension treatment. And addiction treatment is no different. Um, uh, this is the pattern of chronic and relapsing diseases. And I think that uh, many times substance use is considered um, through the prism, particularly among society, among the general public, as one of acute care instead of chronic uh, care. Uh, and I think it's important that we continue our advocacy work to explain that, um, that, that the category of, of, uh, of the disease of, of substance use is one that relates to, to these other chronic disorders. So do prevention, treatment, and recovery services really work in practice to reduce drug use and all of its consequences? Well, yes, they do work. And, um, I don't have to explain this to such a distinguished group um, here gathered today. Uh, we know the journal articles that are published. We know the research. We know um, all of the evidence. 
I wanted to share some of the evidence that INL has collected over the years. My agency, the U.S. Foreign Ministry, the State Department, uh, through our own um, uh, studies and programs, and so I want to share uh, those. We conduct uh, many types of um, outcome evaluation studies of our programs, and so we have been able over the past um, 20 years to document the impact of INL workforce training on drug use. And we um, have control groups, we do, well, we do all kinds of um, of, of studies um, and with different designs. And here are some examples. <clears throat> with our studies in Peru, we identified a 62% reduction in any drug use post-treatment uh, after six months. Uh, in a study in Sri Lanka, 75% uh, drug-free after six, six months of treatment. In Colombia, 44% reduction in any drug use. Um, in Brazil, 40% reduction in cocaine use among high-risk juveniles in Brazil, in Afghanistan, a 31% decrease in opium consumption, 45% decrease uh, for women. This is basically, these are studies where we track clients through treatment, and then post-treatment, we follow up for about uh, one year, typically, or six months, to then look at, at drug use. And we do the same in terms of prevention, looking at uh, impact on uh, initiation within schools. Uh, I won't go through all of these um, in detail. You can read them on the screen. But we have also documented the impact of drug demand reduction interventions on drug production, where we've seen decreases in the sale of drugs, for example, in Peru and uh, drug dealing um, uh, among um, youth in Brazil. We've seen public health uh, impacts in terms of reductions of HIV, um, overdose reductions, 80% in Thailand, intravenous uh, heroin use. Um, suicide attempts amongst women uh, decreased 64% in Afghanistan. We've also seen the impact of INL evaluations on public security uh, with impressive recidivism rates, um, reductions in arrests, in criminal activities, in serious crimes, in non-serious crimes. And you can see the countries there, South Africa, Thailand, Colombia, um, Colombia Afghanistan. And we've also seen the impact of workforce training on economic development. 65% uh, of clients employed six months after treatment in Peru. Um, impact on organized criminal enterprises uh, in gangs and the social impact uh, as well. So in essence, all of these challenges that I pointed to earlier that uh, drug use impacts um, around the world um, in, in many different areas, we also can see just the opposite, where we can, we can um, recover, we can address, we can improve all of these other challenges by uh, using substance use prevention, treatment, and recovery interventions. So that leads me to the third and final part of my presentation, which is how then do we address drug use? And I propose four important ways. Uh, first, to develop and connect the global workforce that addresses this issue that works most closely to those that um, have a substance use disorder or that work with, uh, with youth uh, in prevention. Second, to professionalize the services and improve quality. Third, to build networks and coalitions. And fourth, to adopt a systems approach to analyze and address barriers. So first, the workforce is really critical and vital in everything that uh, we do. Um, I have here sort of a, a, a process by which uh, we've developed that global workforce. First, it's important to identify those that are closest and have the ability to, um, to work with those that have um, substance use or at risk of, of having a substance use disorder. Identifying the workforce is first. And that you typically do through mapping of prevention and treatment um, services and envisioning how to expand that universe by working with other professional groups um, that may not quite be involved yet, but could be involved. Pediatricians, nurses, so many groups uh, which may be involved in part, but can be expanded. Second is to train and develop that workforce. Third is to validate the knowledge and skills of that workforce through examination and credentialing. And finally, is to affiliate that workforce through an international professional association, which is the inspiration and the vision for um, establishing ISA. Many of you are familiar with INL's um, um, core product, the universal curriculum. We have a universal treatment curriculum, universal prevention curriculum, 
This has been translated into 21 languages and disseminated in over 80 countries. Uh, we are currently updating these materials and we are in the process of transforming them into an online platform, which will be available through ISUP. Uh, and so we're very excited by this initiative. It has taken us very many months to work on this and we are on the brink of uh, being able to pilot the first courses on this new online platform and are very excited in the coming year to uh, launch the platform and then to work with our partner governments and civil society partners to translate them into the different languages. I hope that we can get these materials into Ukrainian and uh, be able to disseminate them um, on the, uh, through the ISAP uh, platform uh, at, at the soonest opportunity. Here's a map of where we have uh, disseminated um, some of the UTC programs in the past. And I see that Ukraine and a couple other countries are missing, so I apologize. Um, it's, it's um, I don't know how old it is, maybe it's a year old. And this is, as I mentioned, we are launching the online training hub for ISAP. We will have both treatment and prevention courses, but we will also have uh, courses for other populations with special clinical needs. The idea is that these courses will be um, adapted from the face-to-face um, -face courses with uh, live instructors, it will be both synchronous and asynchronous uh, in nature and um, span uh, many weeks in duration. And in addition, we are also preparing a second uh, series of courses of the UTC, which will be self-guided courses. These will be courses that will be very dynamic and interactive, but, um, but participants will be able to go through them at their own pace. And we are also working to ensure that we can provide credit hours of education for credentialing. Uh, and we've seen already some of the, um, the, the, uh, the work that this, uh, this company has done, Banyan, which is putting these courses together. And it's truly uh, remarkable in, um, in, in uh, the way that they've taken the content, made it engaging, uh, stimulating, and uh, very dynamic. And so I think that, um, that around the world, this will be um, very exciting. It's the type of course that will require um, um, a good amount of, of bandwidth because of all of the things that we've added, but the courses are downloadable also, so they can actually be um, shared and uh, disseminated broadly and do not need to be uh, done for, um, for a country. It will be able to be expanded in, in countries all over the world with all kinds of, of bandwidth. Professionalization and credentialing is also critical. As many of you know, um, INL supported the establishment of the Global Center for Credentialing and Certification. This uh, center provides uh, credentials at different levels uh, for uh, addiction professionals, for prevention. There's a new exam that is also coming out. And we have uh, now uh, affiliated many countries that are part of a global commission that recognize this. So there's reciprocity between countries. The United States is also part of, of this, and we would um, highly encourage and welcome and invite uh, Ukraine to participate, not just at the workforce level, but also for the government to join this Global Center for Credentialing and also recognize this credential. It creates a, a strength of, of being able to recognize one global international standard and the reciprocity which benefits the workforce. Um, we've had practitioners come to the US from other countries uh, and not need to take the U.S. exam uh, for, for credentialing because there is reciprocity between um, countries that recognize this global exam. And I think now we have over 30 countries that um, have that reciprocity um, and recognize this exam. Quality assurance is really vital um, to um, addressing the issue of substance use. If workforce development works from the bottom up to help strengthen that workforce, from the top down, it's very important to provide um, quality standards and to help governments and strengthen their ability to monitor, to ensure quality, and yes, even to regulate uh, and inspect um, centers to ensure that they meet international standards. Uh, we've been proud to support the development of the international standards for treatment of substance use disorders, and there's also international standards for prevention, uh, developed and supported by UNODC and WHO. And it's on the basis of these that over the coming year, we are supporting um, not just with those organizations, but with the European Union's uh, project for Latin America called COPALAD, uh, the development of, um, uh, of sort of harmonized um, uh, essential standards 
that are going to lead to the development of uh, programs where we engage governments and help strengthen and build uh, these national systems. Uh, and in many cases, many countries do already monitor, inspect, uh, regulate their treatment systems. The, uh, the hope that we have is to build a global consortium of quality assurance agencies so that we can have one single global standard for what, um, what you know, effective essential treatment looks like and then to have uh, governments be able to confer that uh, recognition on the treatment programs within their um, countries so that we have, once again, that, that global harmonized standard. I'll just skip uh, this. Um, I said we've been very proud to support and we feel um, in INL and we feel that this is really a vital um, component, a nucleus, a hub for bringing the world together and it's just amazing to see what ISEP has done since 2015 when they were um, launched. Uh, and uh, with so many national chapters, we are so excited that Ukraine has um, joined this, um, this effort. ICU-DDR, also we heard uh, Mikhail Mayovsky, um, we think is a vital component uh, in its ability to promote addiction studies at the university levels, advance applied addiction research through training, such as the universal curriculum that I mentioned, and to support networking between universities and the communities and also between faculty and student exchanges. This is an, uh, another uh, program which we feel provides a very important network uh, and these are drug-free community coalitions bringing together all the sectors of the community to address specific challenges. Uh, the, there's over 5,000 of these community coalitions for drug prevention uh, in the United States and um, INL, State Department, has supported the development of over 300 community coalitions in 23 countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, uh, and with over 10,000 members today. Uh, we hope that um, we can also discuss and explore the possibility of supporting and expanding this um, uh, network in Ukraine in the coming years. And finally, I'll end with the International Technology Transfer Centers because I mentioned that it's really critical and important to build a systems approach. Uh, and that means um, that it's important to look not just at the individual interventions, uh, but it's important to know how they fit into the context of what substance use is in a system. So we may have um, you know, great drug treatment programs with very high effectiveness, but if there are barriers for people to access them, to actually move and and um, receive the services of, of a well-functioning treatment system, then these have to be addressed. And, and we have to look at it from a higher level, a 30,000 foot level, we say in the, in the US. Um, we have to look at it from, from above to see how we can um, organize the system so that it's very uh, interlinked and we have a diversity of services and needs. We know that drug use doesn't look, drug use treatment does not look the same for every single uh, client. We need to tailor and adapt that, and to do that, you need to have a very diversified and well-functioning system. We are very proud and excited this year to support five priority countries in their, um, in, in their work and in uh, establishing or advancing existing technology transfer centers, and Ukraine is one. We've um, been very impressed by the work that they've done for uh, many years and look forward to supporting them for many more with these international technology transfer centers. And here's the network of where uh, these are, the ones in yellow supported by INL this year in Colombia, Peru, Ukraine, Vietnam, and South Africa. And then um, we will have others that will join with their own resources. Uh, and it looks like the ones that are likely to, um, to join and establish those um, MOUs um, soon are uh, Mexico, uh, Czechia, uh, Indonesia, and the United Arab Emirates. And we're very excited to see this network expand and grow. And finally, I will end on the fact that looking at a systems approach, it's also very important to consider the interconnectedness between the public health system and the criminal justice system. And um, we support and, and are expanding around the world the development of alternatives to incarceration, finding ways where we can move people from the criminal justice system into treatment and finding intercept points through which people can be moved in directly into treatment services. The first intercept point being the police, the second one being um, within initial detention, 
uh, the third being uh, within the jails and the court system, uh, the fourth being within the jail and reentry phase, and finally within the probation phase. So everywhere from police to the, to the um, courts to the prisons, um, we have to consider how we can move people into the formal public health system or make sure that there's services that are connected, very much like we have um, case managers uh, within a treatment setting, um, and counselors, it's important to integrate these as people leave out of the criminal justice system to make sure that um, they can also provide the support necessary so that um, all of these necessary services are made available to these individuals. So with that, I want to end by congratulating um, our, my colleagues and partners in Ukraine on the establishment of ISAP, and we look forward to many more launches. ISAP is now joined a very uh, prestigious global community uh, of other national chapters around the world. And uh, it's, it's uh, really my pleasure. I hope I get to um, travel someday to Ukraine and meet with all of you and hear more about your uh, experiences uh, in the field. Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure. Ryan, thank you so much for your input and for your uh, giving your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we move on the next uh, uh, speaker, I uh, have to tell that we have uh, received many welcome messages from different parts of the world. We have a great pleasure to show them today. Uh, on first messages come from Kenya, Lebanon and Argentina. Hello, brothers and sisters from the Ukraine. Privet Brati Isistri is Ukraini. I want, on behalf of ISAP Kenya in Africa, to congratulate you during this auspicious occasion of the launch of the ISAP Ukrainian chapter, being launched today during your eighth annual Psychiatric International Conference. We are looking forward to work with you as you join other national chapters and also the global chapter of ISAP so that we can be able to deal with issues regarding with substance use and substance abuse. Substance abuse. In other words, In other dealing words, with dealing drug, with demand, drug reduction. demand reduction. We will know that you will bring a lot of uh, talent and skills into the field and we will be looking forward to meeting with you at some point uh, during our conferences. Welcome, uh, Las Cabo Prasimo, Muy Lubim Vas, Asante Sana. Hello, this is ISAP Lebanon, hosted by Metro Arabia. We wish you good luck, Ukraine. Hola, soy María Verónica Brasesco, formo parte del capítulo argentino de ISAP. Y quiero hacer llegar a los colegas ucranianos mis más sinceros deseos de éxito para el desarrollo del capítulo de Ucrania. Queridos y queridas colegas en Ucrania, muchos saludos desde Argentina. Los saluda Juan Manuel Migens. Un gusto estar con ustedes. Hola a todos, queridos colegas. Mi nombre es Nicolás Poliansky. Soy psicólogo investigador, miembro del capítulo argentino de ISAP. Quería, a través de este mensaje, darles una calurosa bienvenida al capítulo de ISAP Ucrania. Bienvenidos y que esta nueva etapa sea con muchos éxitos. Saludos. Mi nombre es Roberto Canay, del capítulo de ISAP Argentina. Quería saludar a Irina y a todo el equipo que conforman ISAP Ucrania. Creo que formar parte de una red como ISAP abre una infinita cantidad de oportunidades de acceso a información, capacitaciones y sobre todo contacto con colegas y profesionales de diferentes países. Desde Argentina estamos siempre dispuestos a cooperar y trabajar en conjunto. Así que les deseo mucha suerte y felicitaciones. We move uh, on to our next uh, speaker. I would like to introduce Joanna Travis Roberts, Chief Executive of ISAP, 
the International Society of Substance Use Professionals. Thank you, Joanna, for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you and uh, hello, everybody. I will just open my presentation. I hope that is working for you all. So um, as Irina said, I'm the chief executive of ISERP and very excited to be part of today's event welcoming ISAP Ukraine to the to the ISAP family. Um, a little bit of background about the organization. We're a global non-governmental organization. We have currently over 16,000 members and the aim is really to support the development of the workforce, of the um, professions on the ground, um, as well as promoting evidence-based and high quality policy and practice in the fields of prevention, treatment and recovery. And ISIP likes to think of itself as bringing a space for um, those people that are undertaking this work to interact, collaborate and really bring all realms together to um, recognise them as part of this workforce. Our vision is a connected, trained, knowledgeable and effective international network of substance use prevention treatment and recovery support professionals who are undertaking and promoting high quality evidence-based and ethical substance use prevention treatment and recovery support and this is um, you know a lot to look at in in one image but we really use it to demonstrate that we consider ISA to be a place for anybody working in or interested in the drug demand reduction field so we do include we consider you know volunteers we consider family members we consider all of the professionals that are working within education health sectors and um, criminal justice etc so it's very very broad the number and the types of um, professionals and workers that we consider as part of our ISAP network background of the organization and we're funded uh, by the US Department of State Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs who you've just heard from represented by Brian and the organization really originated from a group brought together by INL who were calling really for a moment to bring together all of the field um, to co for coherence and collaboration and really ISAP sort of grew from that concept of bringing everyone together. We work very closely with all of the organisations that Brian has talked about uh, that are supported within INL, but also particularly with the International Consortium of Universities for Drug Demand Reduction and uh, Colombo Plans Global Centre for Credentialing and Certification. And together we sort of piece different parts of this workforce support and professionalization. As I said, we're a membership organization and we have over 16,000 members currently from 167 countries. And that membership is free. We have four membership levels. So we try to in include the spectrum of people that are working. We have student members, a regular membership who is, which is really targeting those that are interested or starting out on their professional journey. A professional membership, which really recognizes that there are a lot of professionals that are um, going about their day-to-day -day life that are not only focused on drug demand reduction, but have um, that as part of their job. But then also the uh, membership level for the professionals that are totally specialised on this field. A little indication of the, our spread of membership at the moment. We do have representation in all of the regions, but we are gradually growing and our, our sort of touch around the world is spreading. So what, how do we actually do our work? What do we do with uh, with all of that background and all of the people that we're in touch with. We deliver our mission through three channels, digital, which includes our website, um, our social media, our email newsletter, 
our events and our ISIP national chapters where, um, as you are hearing about today, we're, we can really access local knowledge networks and have that exchange on a country level. So I'll just talk you to you a little bit more about some of those provisions. The ISAP website is um, a huge resource. There's lots of components to the ISAP website. We currently have it in five languages and we're always developing the language provision. Within that, we have a knowledge share, which is where any ISAP member can come and post research, news, publications or resources that are really of use to people that are working in the field and ISAP as well uh, researchers and puts key things within that knowledge share. We have the networks which is where people can talk and collaborate and work on projects or have meetings together online. We have a professional development training section which uh, gives links through to areas that people can get training, gives more information about the universal curriculum that Brian talked about and as we uh, mentioned that the, we want to launch our online learning hub in collaboration with partners. We then have events and a calendar that links people to items that are happening that are of interest to them, as well as a section which gives more information on all of our national chapters. And my ISAP profile allows um, all the members to edit their own information and find other members. And of course, we have regular news about what ISAP is actually up to. As well as the website, we are online um, in other places. So as I mentioned, we have our email, which goes out every fortnight with a summary of key ISAP news, but also selections from the website that really are um, very useful. We have presence on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn, so people can go on there and interact with us or get key pieces of information as well. On to the national chapters. So you can see here a list of where we have established national chapters in orange and we have those that are in progress. There's currently 22 established national chapters of four in process. And it's really key for us to be able to connect at that country level. We can do so much more when things are, people are being able to build networks within their own workforce, within their own language, remit, cultural reference point, et cetera. And that also really does boost the global membership of ISAP because we then hear more from what's happening on the ground within countries. And you can see here just a little selection of um, a lot of the activity that's going on, which is currently happening through our national chapters, but happening online. The last part of the um, our channels of work is our ISAP event. And you can see here that previously we've, we've had events in Thailand, Brazil, Mexico, Kenya, um, and Austria and that this year we held our first virtual conference and that has just finished which was very exciting to do that in collaboration with ISAP South Africa and a group of partners there and we're planning for another in-person event in March uh, sorry February 2022 and we we do hope and look forward very much to being able to be together in person Within these events, there's very many components. We have more traditional conference presentations. There are training opportunities, networking meetings happening. Our partners come and hold their key meetings. So they really are a hub of activity of bringing people together. And as I said, we were very excited to hold our first online version of our event, um, which happened in four languages over two months we had six sessions and it was excellent to work with our partners to really bring that essence of an ISAP event to to an online presence as well as larger events like that we do regularly have webinars and this is just a list of some of the ones that were undertaken by our national chapters between March and October this year but they are constantly happening and I urge you to go and you know I've talked about a lot of things that are on the website but to keep in touch with the website and the social media so that we can you can see these things that are upcoming and, and might be relevant for you or or your network there 
So um, all that's left really, having given you a brief introduction to ISIP on, on a global level, is to really um, welcome ISIP Ukraine. And it's wonderful. It's, it's really my um, pleasure to be launching ISIP Ukraine today as one of our national chapters. Um, I want to say thank you very much to Irena and Olha and the team there at ISIP Ukraine for all the work that you've done to, to bring the ISIP Ukraine to this point. We are really very happy to be collaborating with the Ukraine and the workforce there and taking the ISIP mission to the ground within the country. I urge you to join ISIP Ukraine, it's free, allows you to access all of those resources I have mentioned and more and really gives you the possibility of building that network within your country, connecting with each other and with ISIP. We wish you all the best, ISIP Ukraine, and welcome to the ISIP family. Thank you very much for your contribution into our event and uh, for your support uh, uh, you, um, our international level. And we uh, continue to show uh, our welcome uh, video message. The next ones we received from ISAP Pakistan and ISAP Chile. Hello everyone, my name is Saima Asir. I am director at the Pakistan chapter. And on behalf of ISAP Pakistan chapter, I would like to congratulate you all to establish ISAP Ukraine chapter. We are feeling very excited and welcome you all to become a part of ISAP Global Family as national chapter. Together, we will carry on the mission of ISAP Global, especially to promote evidence-based practices in STD treatment and prevention field. We are also very grateful to ISAP Global team for always having their support and uniting all of us through this wonderful platform. Once again, I would like to extend my warmest welcome and best wishes for ISAP Ukraine from Pakistan. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much to Mrs. Irina Penchak, Head of ISAP Ukraine, for inviting us to share our fraternal greeting. I am Lorena Contreras, President of the Chilean Chapter ISAP. On behalf of the board, I would like to warmly welcome all members of ISAP Ukraine. ISAP is a family that allows professionals and research from all over the world to be connected. Through ISAP, you will be able to share experience, knowledge, and opportunities for professional development with different cultures and realities. I'm sure that you will make an important contribution to the development of ISAP. We send our sincere congratulations to the board of ISAP Ukraine, Ukraine for taking on for the great challenge, the great challenge of a new chapter in your country. We know you will find a lot of support in ISAP Global and other chapters. We send you our best wishes from Chile and welcome. Our next uh, speaker, okay. Olga Mushakivska uh, from Ukraine. She is a national chapter regional coordinator of International uh, Society of Substance Use Professionals. She will tell us about the role of the national chapter regional coordinator. Olga, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Irene, and it's a really great pleasure to be a part of today's event and uh, just open my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, fine, thanks. So, good afternoon, dear colleagues. My uh, name is Olha Mushakivska, and I'm currently working with ISOP as its National Chapter Regional Coordinator in Asia. And I will talk today about regional coordinators' role. So currently we have ISAP has four regional coordinators. For the Americas, it's Livia Edgar, uh, who is also the deputy director of ISAP. Uh, for the Europe and Middle East, it's Jeff Lee. 
also the first executive director of ISOP and senior consultant. Jeff is the ISOP Ukraine coordinator. For the Africa region, it is my honor to present you Michael uh, Brobe. And for the Asia region, uh, Olha Mushikivska, and it's me. Uh, so, what is the role of National Chapter Regional Coordinator? And um, firstly, it's continuous communication. We have regular communication with each of the national chapter individually and as a group. We discuss current activities, future plans, and the way forward for further development of the national chapter operation. Uh, we have regular bi-monthly communication where we plan a future perspective and joint activities. Uh, we arrange meetings with representatives of ISAP partner organizations. And uh, we invite speakers from our partner organization to cont contribute into our event. Um, we work together to build our membership and uh, grow our website and social media communication and to engage and inform our communities about the way forward to achieve a high quality, evidence-based and ethical practice in drug demand reduction undertaken by professional workforce. Um, together, we uh, seek uh, to ensure that ISAP at the national level operates as a microcosm of ISAP at the global level. And um, it is my um, and it has been my great pleasure to present the world famous speakers from different fields of prevention and treatment who regularly contribute and share their experience and gave their expertise on the best practices. So included in the role of the original coordinator support is the need to encourage and monitor on the activity of each national chapter in the region. Uh, it also involves help to plan and to support on regional and national meetings and events undertaken by national chapter in the region. And uh, ISAP is a membership organization and um, we seek to build on 17,000 members of ISAP Global and the membership of each of our 24 national chapters. We hope you all will become members of uh, ISAP Ukraine and um, take advantage of the increasing number of benefits that membership can bring. Uh, ISAP remains a relative new international organization, but it is a through and growing organization that is given a focus uh, to the need for the professional approach to the international needs to address drug demand reduction. And it is my pleasure as a Ukrainian to see that ISAP Ukraine is showing a lead in the region and to share ISAP message and mission. I hope you will help us to build, uh, to build our work and to help our national uh, properly address this very important issue. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Olga, for your presentation. Thanks. We uh, have two more welcome uh, video from ISAP uh, Philippines and Kazakhstan. Please switch on these messages uh, of welcomes. Hi, everyone. I am Chit Castillo of ISAP Philippines, and we wish to extend our heartfelt congratulations to ISAP Ukraine for the launching of your national chapter. We wish you all the best in your journey in achieving the goals and objectives of ISAP. And we hope to be able to collaborate with you and partner with you in sometime in the future. So ISAP Ukraine, congratulations. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. От лица службы охраны психического здоровья Республики Казахстан позвольте поприветствовать организаторов и всех участников международной 
конференции «Психиатрия 21 века. Глобальное влияние на современное общество и новые практики в этой области». В первую очередь мы хотим поздравить наших дорогих, уважаемых коллег с тем, что они являются членами Международного общества специалистов по профилактике и лечению употребления психотерапевтических веществ и создали свою национальную часть «Айса Украина». Желаем вам процветания, эффективного труда и огромных успехов. От чистого сердца поздравляем коллег из Украины. Мы совсем недавно начали свою работу с командой «Айсов Казахстан», но уже хотели бы отметить присущие вам профессионализм, отзывчивость и ответственность. Мы хотим пожелать вам успехов в работе, процветания и профессиональных побед. Надеемся на дальнейшее плодотворное сотрудничество. С наилучшими пожеланиями. Команда «Айсов Казахстан».International Consortium of University for Drug Demand Reduction. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Kutsinok uh, couldn't uh, join us today due to, to great time difference, but she sent uh, us this very important contribution. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Igor Kutsinok, and I live in California, so right now it's 2 o'clock in the morning in my part of the world, so this is why I'm recording this presentation. Uh, first, I would like to thank my colleagues in Ukraine for inviting me to share with you some thoughts. I would like to congratulate them um, with the inauguration of the Ukrainian chapter of the ISAP, International Society of Substance Use Professionals, which I think is a great accomplishment by, by the colleagues in Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, and again, this, this is a great privilege and great pleasure, it just unfortunately because of the virus, we cannot do it in person. Uh, it's very unfortunate, something that I I'm sorry about it, but we are trying to, to do the best we can. So what I would like to share with you has something to do with our, with the primary functions of the International Technology Transfer, Transfer Center that we are running in Ukraine. Uh, and Dr. Irina Pinchuk is the Ukrainian director and Dr. Yulia Yachnik is the Ukrainian program coordinator for this project. Our primary function is training, education, and building competent workforce in addiction medicine at every level, not just physicians, not just medical professionals, psychiatrists, or psychologists, but actually at every level of, uh, of the issue because so many people are involved in addiction treatment, addiction prevention, uh, and recovery support, and many other aspects of substance use disorders. As a way of getting started, I would like to uh, offer you a hypothetical. Imagine you are a prime minister of a country X, and you just got a report, a reliable report, suggesting that only 20% of patients with diabetes in your country are getting any form of treatment, meaning 80% of patients with diabetes never get any treatment, and among this 20% who are getting treatment, typically the treatment starts when uh, their kidneys already failed, uh, they're blind, uh, and their legs are amputated because of the complications of diabetes. So what would you do as a prime minister of the country X? I know what I would do. I would do two things immediately. First, I would fire the Minister of Health right away. And secondly, I would demand a significant investment and significant attention to the education and training 
in early detection and early interventions in people with diabetes. So we will be able to prevent the complications from happening and we will be able to detect and cover with treatment as many diabetes patients as possible. So everything I'm saying makes perfect sense in my mind, not just from the medical perspective, but from even from the common sense perspective. Okay. Unfortunately, in addiction treatment, this is exactly what is happening all over the world, not just in Ukraine, not just in the United States, it, it is happening all over the world. Because unfortunately, nobody get, gets fired, no minister of health, at least to my knowledge, got fired for not offering treatment to people who could have been treated much before the severe complications happened. Look at the epidemiology. Approximately 70 to 75% of the population, these are people who do not have any problems with substances. They either have very low risk for substance use disorders or they, they don't use drugs or alcohol at all. So in this population, we don't actually need much in the interventions. We just need to do some typical prevention to prevent it from happening. And that's about it. We have a relatively sizable population of people, 20 to 25%. These are people who already have some relationship and some difficulties relevant to drugs and alcohol. Uh, the difficulties are not very severe yet. Uh, the, these are people who will never show up in a psychiatric office, or, uh, but they are very likely to be in touch with their primary healthcare system or primary physician primary care doctors or nurses. So these are people who already have some challenges, but the challenges are not severe yet. Uh, and th these are people who typically don't go to an addiction psychiatrist or any kind of mental health professional. And we also have approximately five to 10% of people who already developed severe medium to severe substance use disorders with lots of complications, both individual, physiological, and psychosocial. Here's what happens in addiction treatment world all over the world. We actually don't pay much attention to these two populations. These are people who are usually are not getting any treatment and very rarely get any meaningful intervention. And unfortunately, most of our attention is focused on this population. These are people with very significant difficulties and significant biological and psychosocial complications as a result of their medium to severe substance use disorders. Would you expect very good and very promising therapeutic and recovery management outcomes in the population since we missed the opportunity to intervene here? And now with all the complications and all the challenges, that these people are already experiencing. Now we start treatment with sometimes strange expectation that this treatment will be effective or will result in significant positive changes, both biologically and psychosocially. No one, no minister of health actually got fired for the picture that I just presented you. And again, let me tell you, this is not just in Ukraine. We, we see this all over the world. The, uh, one of the big questions, <coughs> Is, is it worth doing addiction treatment even from, from the cost effectiveness perspective? In the United States, the annual cost of substance use and problems related to substance use is $440 billion. Just to put it in the perspective, the cost of Iraq and Afghanistan wars combined is less than that. In other words, we are losing more money for problems relevant to drug and alcohol use in the United States every year. The amount of money is significantly larger than the cost of the two wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. So one of the questions is, is it really make sense? Does it make sense from the cost effectiveness and from even from financial perspective to invest money in addiction treatment? Because sometimes people say, yeah, it's always, it, it's all nice but we don't have money to do that. Yes, it is. Because if you look at the data, 
cost effectiveness analysis, uh, effectiveness analysis, the data shows that every dollar invested in addiction treatment actually had saved six and a half to seven dollars. Believe me, colleagues, even the greediest Wall Street banks would consider this a wonderful return to the investment. One to seven is a very good return of your money. So definitely investing time and finances and resources into addiction treatment, even from the cost effectiveness analysis makes perfect sense. And here is what we have in terms of one of the reasons why people who could have been treated, typically they, we miss the opportunity to treat them in time. Well, unfortunately, I need to show with you a couple of bad news coming from a study from Columbia University. And their, their, their findings, by the way, they're consistent with findings from other similar studies. The funny findings show that more than 50% of doctors actually did not address substance use at all with their patients, doctors in primary healthcare environment. More than 40% of patients actually reported the physicians actually did miss the diagnosis of substance use disorder because they've never asked this question. Even when physicians in primary health care settings, even if they found something that resembles substance use disorder, they typically do not include patients in the decision making or some form of, some form of uh, treatment engagement, treatment seeking engagement. When the physicians, the primary health care physicians have been asked, actually less than 20% of them said that they're, they feel competent to talk about drug and alcohol use with their patients. So folks, please pay attention to that. So when we say that physicians do not even ask this question in many instances, in more than 50% of cases, most likely this is not because they don't know that they need to ask these questions or explore this area of physical and mental health. Most likely this is because they are afraid and they don't know what to do if the answer is a yes. So what's next? This is something that we definitely need to be very careful and we need to increase the amount of training if we don't want to end up with a situation like I gave you as an example at the beginning, the situation with diabetes. What are the most typical reasons why physicians are not particularly interested in asking questions about drug and alcohol use? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, sometimes they just, they're lacking knowledge and clinical skills. And they, it's not their fault, it's our fault because we did not train them well enough. Another very important reason for uh, not even addressing this issue is the typical negative attitude towards substance use disorders. The physicians and the doctors and, and healthcare practitioners are part of the general mainstream society. And all of the phenomenon that we're observing in the society, they're typical for the physicians as well. So the negative attitude is very, very common all over the world, including in Ukraine. Also, even if medical students and medical trainees have been exposed to patients with substance use disorders, usually they see patients at the end stage of the addiction with severe problems. They rarely get the exposure to patients in primary healthcare settings, patients who still do not have severe problems, but they already have some difficulties with substance use. And many studies have shown that if we are capable to improve our training in medical schools, that will actually result in significant improvement in treatment outcomes when these people become physicians or nurses or medical practitioners and start seeing and treating patients. We also know from the research, multiple studies, that skill-based training curricula, meaning curricula that involve not just talking about something, but practicing different new skills. This type of curricula are significantly more effective than just didactic lecturing or telling people what to do. We also know that in uh, medical universities or nursing schools or social work schools, having at least one faculty member who is competent in addiction medicine will significantly increase the outcomes, tra training outcomes in the students. And we also know that when we combine and interact the expertise, uh, combine the expertise 
with didactic and interactive lectures and practical exercises with, uh, with coaching and mentoring of the students, that will result in a sustainable long-term changes, positive changes. In the, primary, uh, in the primary care, this is exactly the environment, the primary healthcare delivery system. These are the places where people with some initial difficulties or initial low severity substance use disorders will end up seeking help for all sorts of problems, not for substance use per se. They can come to a physician with high blood pressure or a headache or weight loss or something else, something that is pretty common, pretty common reasons, some of the common reasons for people to seek medical help. This is exactly the right place to detect the problem and to start intervening. Um, the, and interestingly enough, sometimes physicians say, well, we don't ask because even if we do ask, they're not gonna tell us. The studies by the Columbia University and some other studies, actually they've shown that these are patients who will never tell you unless you ask. If you ask, actually more than 70% of them will tell you the truth, that they do have some challenges with alcohol, they do have some problems with tobacco use, and they do have some problems with probably some other drug use. So if you don't ask, they won't tell. But if you do ask, they're likely to tell you, and that might be a good opportunity to initiate significant conversation. We talked about the possible barriers. Why? We are not very good in training our medical professionals in addiction medicine. In addition to that, even if when in some schools, even when we do train people in medical schools, we don't necessarily train them in implementing evidence-based and science-driven methods of treatment. This is just a pyramid of how much how much, how great is the reliability of different scientific methods to establish evidence-based practices and then we'll start training people in doing this type of work. Let's go back to the same slide. The reason why we do have the ISAP chapter in Ukraine, the reason why Ukraine is one of the members of the International Consortium of Universities on Drug Demand Reduction, the reason why Thank God the, the United States State Department supported the development of the International Technology Transfer Center in Ukraine that was formerly, we knew it as, as an addiction technology transfer center that was operational since 2017 in Ukraine. The reasons for having all of these organizations and paying so much attention, not just in Ukraine, but since we are talking about Ukraine, this is the Ukrainian conference, that's why the focus is on Ukraine. The primary reason is to make sure that as a result of our educational and technology transfer processes, not just training, but training followed by skill building, by coaching, mentoring, and all other necessary, necessary steps, we will start paying attention to this type of the population. The population that could have been helped much before severe problems have developed and they joined these five to 10% of people with very severe problems. I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope we'll have a chance to work with you when, when all this COVID craziness is over and we will be able to travel. I would, probably the first thing I will do, I will jump on a plane and will come to Kiev, to Ukraine, and hopefully we'll see you in person will continue our work. Again, I want to thank all of you for the fantastic work you are doing for the conference that you put together despite all of these difficulties. I want to thank particularly Dr. Pinchuk and Dr. Yachnik for their tremendous amount of work they have done. I wish you all success. Be good to yourself, take good care of each other, and hopefully we will see each other soon. Thank you very much. Good luck. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you. And uh, we also would like to thank Professor Korzenok for sending us this very important contribution. Thank you. And it is my pleasure to present our last speaker, head of ISAP Ukraine National Chapter, director of Institute of Psychiatry of the Rostovchenko National University of Kyiv, 
Vice President of the Ukrainian Psychiatric Association, Country Director, International Technology Transfer Center Ukraine, Professor Irina Pinchuk. Irina, I hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, you can see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. I am very pleased uh, to announce today that Ukrainian has joined to International Society of Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Professionals. ISAP is an international non-for-profit, non-governmental organization uh, which uh, has been established to promote the professionalism of the prevention, treatment and recovery workforce and essential for ISAP are the establishment of evidence-based, qualitative and ethical uh, politics and practice in the field of drug demand reduction. Uh, national chapter status is given to newly formed national organization whose work focus will be within uh, the drug demand reduction file and uh, will be established under the country national chapter name, for example, uh, ISAP Ukraine. The process of uh, the ISAP Ukraine began uh, in spring uh, 2019. An official statement was written. Methodological documents concerning to the mission's purpose, task of the national chapter were studied. Meeting with the organization's management were held within the framework of international conference and online. Uh, we participate in the meeting, meeting uh, with uh, head of uh, national chapter uh, who are already members of ISAP. Uh, meetings and discussion uh, on the possibility, possi possible uh, creation of national chapter were held with representatives from Kazakhstan and Czech uh, Republic. After making uh, the decision to establish the ISAP Ukraine, uh, the following questions were raised. A questions of local home base and the first team of specialists who will begin the history of uh, the ISAP Ukraine. Today, ISAP Ukraine National Chapter works on the base of the Institute of Psychiatry of Taras Shevchenko National uh, University of uh, Ukraine. Uh, our teams, uh, I am Andrei Salonsky, Alexei Kolodezhny, Sergei Baltanosov, Natalia Atamanchu. We have uh, uh, defined uh, our goals. They are to represent the international and Ukrainian communities of substance use prevention, treatment and recovery support professionals, uh, to develop and uh, deliver knowledge system for evidence-based prevention, treatment and recovery support, to provide opportunities uh, uh, for and access to training, educational and uh, uh, credential. To offer communication and uh, networking opportunity taking place online and ISAP event. Uh, to achieve our goals, we have developed national chapter work plan 2020 national uh, chapter activities and move forward during this plan in this year. In 2020, despite uh, uh, the change in operating condition due to COVID-19 pandemic, we managed uh, to build a strong foundation for the further development of the ISAP Ukraine uh, national chapter, chapter. Today, the ISAP Ukraine uh, has 47 members. 
we began uh, to build network among the major drug demand reduction organization and uh, network of ATTC partners in Ukraine, PIPFAR founded agencies, NGOs and state organization and leading specialists involved in addiction treatment and prevention programs or policy making. Uh, we have Ukraine national chapter page uh, on ISAP website and Facebook page where we post information about our activities. Uh, we plan to present ISAP Ukraine at the National Mental Health Conference. Uh, this is uh, happening uh, today. We started uh, the process of uh, UTC national trainers preparation. So up to today we have 18 UTC modules in Ukrainian language. We officially approved, licensed and implemented three courses based on UTC modules to postgraduate education. They are the first UTC courses which are implemented into the state educational system in Ukraine. Uh, here are these courses, substance use disorders and uh, comorbid disorders, screening, uh, brief intervention and referral to treatment, motivational enhancement treatment strategies. Also, we implemented 20 hours UTC-based topics in psychiatry uh, curriculum for the fourth-year medical students. Uh, from March till September, we ran UTC training for faculty members from different uh, medical uh, universities. This is uh, our uh, Facebook page and uh, website. If uh, you want to uh, become a member of ISAP, uh, Ukraine National Chapter, please uh, enter our page uh, on the website, fill in and uh, send an application. We invite everyone to join us for the main mission to establish substance use prevention, treatment and recovery support as a unique and multidisciplinary field through the professionalism and development of its network of substance use prevention, treatment and recovery support professionals. We are open to cooperation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Irina, for your great input, and I hand over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Olga. And um, can I also say welcome and thank you to Jeff Lee, who is with us from ISAP Global. Jeff mm -hmm. has been very active and supportive in the establishment of ISAP Ukraine, and we are very pleased to have his input with Olga uh, support our development. Thank you, Jeff. Now, ISAP Ukraine is opened. We would like to thank everyone for participating and our speakers for their great contribution to this event. Also, I would like to say thank you to our technical support and to our interpreter. We sincerely invite you to join an ISAP family and to become ISAP members. Link to the website and application form can be found in the chat and on the website. Thank you for your time and interest.